Hello, I am Eli Adashi, host of Medscape One-on-One. -on -One. Joining me today is Senator Ron Wyden. Welcome. Doctor, thank you for having me. I've been looking forward to this. As a seasoned attorney, how do you think about the constitutionality of the individual mandate of the Affordable Care Act that is currently being reviewed by the Supreme Court? Doctor, despite your inflationary introduction <laughs> there, I, I am barely a lawyer in name only. My wife uh, likes to say that uh, one consideration in marrying me was that I wasn't a real lawyer. <laughs> I have felt from the beginning that the court would uphold it because if ever there was an issue where you really saw the commerce power in action, it's health care. I mean, this is clearly an industry with enormous uh, expanse in terms, of, in terms of it reach. So I always thought the court would uphold it. Now, if you go through some of the oral arguments, particularly with, uh, with Justice uh, Kennedy, uh, there are some questions about whether the court will, uh, will uphold it, but I'm very hopeful that they will. I certainly don't want to go back to the days when the insurance companies can discriminate against anyone with a pre-existing condition. If you go back to that, uh, that day, the health system is basically just there for the healthy and the wealthy, and that's completely unacceptable. Assuming for the moment, and granted none of us really knows, that the Affordable Care Act is overturned in part or in whole, in your mind, and you've been in this arena for a long time, what kind of scenarios do you envision? Well, for, first of all, I, I think that Medicare is going to be front and center on the health agenda under any circumstance because clearly Medicare is the great challenge for the budget. Uh, I was not a supporter of the earlier legislation in, in, in the House. I thought that in many respects it was sort of voucher or couponed care sort of approach. But I have been working uh, with Congressman Paul Ryan. He's chairman of the House uh, Budget Committee in hopes that we could forge a bipartisan approach around something known as premium support. Mm -hmm. Now, premium support is different than vouchers. Vouchers are a fixed sum, and the sum has not kept up with the health costs of older people. Premium support, on the other hand, is variable. It's tied to the health care costs of a senior in a given uh, area, and uh, also we would use a system of competitive bidding, which will ensure that every senior has affordable choices in their area, but also can serve to help uh, hold down costs. Can you see any constellation under which you might wish to reintroduce the Wyden-Bennett bill that I believe was introduced twice before, but on the assumption that significant changes will transpire with the Affordable Care Act, can you see a circumstance whereby the bill could become relevant again? Well, for, first of all, I think the bill will always be relevant because a number of the features that we felt most strongly about were included in the final law. For example, uh, the legislation that Senator Bennett and I put, uh, put together was the first bipartisan bill to really lay out a plan for the insurance exchanges. These are, in effect, uh, almost a farmer's uh, market where people are <laughs> able to hold down their costs. Mm -hmm. They're part of a big group. There is what's called guaranteed issues so people can get coverage in you take an approach that really amounts to community rating in order to hold down um, the costs. So we proposed that. Much of what we proposed made its way on the exchange issue into the final uh, legislation. There were a number of other uh, features that 
that uh, I pushed very hard for that were uh, included, uh, particularly a waiver provision so that states could go mm-hmm. off and try their uh, own uh, approaches. I also developed uh, an approach for care at home for senior citizens. We've just uh, seen the announcement of the original, uh, it's called Independence at Home uh, program. This will be hugely important because about 75% of the Medicare bill is in effect uh, dealing with chronic disease, heart and stroke and diabetes and cancer, and many of those people can be cared for at home And when they are, the VA has found that they could save upwards of 20%. So those were all features that uh, uh, I worked for uh, uh, very vigorously as uh, the Finance Committee was uh, moving ahead with the the legislation. They're part of the law, and uh, as I say, I I hope and believe that the law will be, uh, be upheld. I would say whether it is or isn't, there are some other attractive features in the Wyden Belt. Bennett uh, proposal, which I still hope at some point could be incorporated into a future bill. But staying with Medicare for a moment, you have recently joined forces with Paul Ryan, as you mentioned, uh, in a very creative proposal to reform Medicare. Can you share with our viewers perhaps the highlights of that proposal? And where do you see it in terms of momentum uh, as we speak? Before we get into the legislation with Paul Ryan, let me touch on another Medicare proposal that was also part of the Healthy Americans Act in a slightly different form. Recently, Senator uh, Rob Portman and I, he's the Republican senator from Ohio, after consulting with the Oregon Health Sciences Center and the Cleveland uh, Clinic, introduced for the first time legislation that would financially reward seniors for engaging in good preventive practices like smoking cessation, reducing uh, uh, body mass, lowering cholesterol, blood pressure, uh, preventive steps of that nature. Medicare has never done that. And we have come up with a plan where seniors, uh, certainly in the first few years, could be eligible for a savings of about $200. And then as we move into... Uh, the next uh, period be eligible for savings of up to $400, in effect saying that when they save Medicare money by engaging in these smart preventive uh, steps, they should be able to share in the savings. So another part of what uh, I had been advocating in the Healthy Americans Act, uh, uh, I continue to follow up on with legislation that uh, Rob Portman and I recently introduced. Now, with respect to the legislation with Paul Ryan, it really starts from the proposition that no one would go out and buy a house without having some idea what they're paying for. This was a thought uh, uh, offered up originally by by Dr. David Cutler, who was very well uh, well known uh, in the Northeast and around, uh, around the country. And much of what we're going to have to do with Medicare is to ensure that traditional Medicare with its purchasing power is maintained while at the same time we offer private sector choices so the two will strengthen each other. And in that sense, we recognize that much of the Medicare debate is not at all ideological. Protecting the Medicare guarantee the needs of more than 40 million uh, seniors, in particular when you uh, look at it, involves such critical questions as what are we going to do to make sure that all seniors can get a doctor? What we see already in our state is that many seniors might have a heart problem. They might have problems with you know blood pressure. They make six, eight, 10 calls to physicians, and the physician has essentially put up a sign saying no longer accepting Medicare patients because they don't know what the reimbursement rate will be or it's too low. So this is not an ideological question. In my state, more than 40% of the seniors have chosen what's called Medicare Advantage, 
And to a great extent, a lot of them are making that choice because they know they can get access to a talented physician and will not have to face this kind of Russian roulette of having to make calls all over town just in hopes of being yes. able to see someone. Speaking of which, the come January of next year, the sustainable growth rate formula will call for 32% reduction in the reimbursement of participating Medicare physicians, to say nothing of the 2% that the sequester process will superimpose on that. Drawing on your substantial background in this area, can we look forward to a so-called doc fix sometime in 2013? And if so, how would you suggest we go about it? Well, it, it's time to end this roller coaster. I mean, we have seen the Congress lurch from one short-term extension to another, and I think we ought to understand that this is not some sort of uh, matter where the so-called fat cat physician is going to be able to get some lavish uh, reimbursement uh, rate. What we're seeing is that more and more physicians, particularly in my home state in rural areas, in urban areas, walking on an economic tightrope trying to keep their offices you know, open, and it's critically important that a reasonable approach be put in place. And I'm struck by how many physicians would almost like to see this abolished and start over. We've mentioned your reaching out to Congressman Paul Ryan across the aisle on the Medicare issue. Moving now for a moment to Medicaid, do the two of you agree on an approach to Medicaid? In other words, do you subscribe to the notion of block grants as proposed by Mr. Ryan, or, or do you differ on this issue? I do, and, and this is an area where uh, clearly more work is going to be necessary to come up with a bipartisan approach. If you look at our white paper, that we put out in December of last year, you will see a very strong and very focused effort to protect the neediest seniors, the most vulnerable seniors, what are called seniors who are dual eligibles. They're eligible yes. for Medicare and Medicaid. My concern is if you block grant Medicaid, the most vulnerable, the most needy of seniors those who are low income and need institutional care would have their fate very, very uncertain at best, left to the sort of vagaries of the, the states, and that's something I couldn't support. Ironically, for the non-institutional Medicaid you know, population, I've taken an approach that's probably been too bold for either either party. For example, I've said that much of, of, of Medicaid uh, really uh, con consists of apartheid. I mean, it's, it's sort of a, a second-class, you know, system. Yes. And what I'd really like is to see a poor child sitting next to a congressperson's, you know, child. And I advocated in the Healthy Americans Act that poor people be eligible for the same benefits, uh, essentially, as everybody else, coverage much like their member of Congress gets. Speaking of Medicaid, uh, last week uh, the Department of Health and Human Services uh, granted the state of Oregon a waiver which would allow it to launch a bold demonstration project that would feature so-called coordinated care organizations. Could you expand on that somewhat for the benefit of our viewers and perhaps use this opportunity to say something about whether or not you think this experiment could serve as a model for other states? Well, there, there's a reason our, our state is known as the innovation state. 
And this is another very good example. And enormous credit uh, is, uh, is earned here by Dr. John Kitzhaber, who has really been for two decades the now, governor the leader, of Oregon. That's correct. The mm -hmm. leader of this effort, beginning with the Oregon Health Plan several decades uh, ago. And what this is, in my view, is the future of the Medicaid program. This is a model for Medicaid, and it really takes the principle that you see in the Affordable Care Act and in uh, effective programs, whether it's group health, for example, uh, north of us in, in Washington State, or uh, the Mayo program, or uh, other Geisinger in, in Pennsylvania. A lot of these programs uh, are all based on the idea of integrating uh, services, yes. integrating health care yes. for, uh, for the people. And what we're seeking to do is focus on the Medicaid population. Now, what's really gutsy about this is historically under uh, Medicaid you know, approaches. Rhode Island, your state, mm -hmm. uh, for example, is uh, just such a state. They can make the decision with respect to mm -hmm. opting out of the program mm -hmm. as it evolves. Under the approach that Dr. Kitzhaber has advanced, in effect, if certain cost guidelines are not met, the federal government is empowered to say, we're going to uh, take away the right to operate this waiver. So it's a gutsy approach. It was a bipartisan approach. I was very pleased to uh, be in a position as a member of the Finance Committee to uh, work closely with uh, the Obama administration, particularly uh, Secretary Sebelius, and uh, we're just very pleased to see this program uh, uh, approved, and I think it's going to be a great success. I think most physicians would also appreciate that this program focuses on care coordination, which is finally addressing health care delivery, not just cost, but the form of delivery which undoubtedly we can use a lot of improvement in. In effect, there are almost two sides of the same coin. Uh, I think Governor Kitzhaber is absolutely right to focus on the delivery system and put a focus on prevention. What I and Chairman Ryan have looked at is also in addition to that, which is so important, to try, particularly through competitive bidding, to put a new focus on cost containment. A reporter in uh, Oregon, a journalist, recently compared to some extent purchasing health care like purchasing wine because he said people, when they're talking about fine wines, they don't want to purchase the least expensive. Usually they like to purchase the second least expensive so that if you say all the wines are going to be you know, good uh, quality, the second least expensive is the one that in effect sets the bar for the price of fine wines. That's the standard that is used in our legislation. So in effect, it is the second least expensive or traditional Medicare tied to the actual costs that someone might incur in a given uh, area and I think by taking those two approaches, the coordination of care, the delivery system that Dr. Kitzhaber has, in in my view, performed yeoman work in laying out, and looking also at ways to hold down the cost, particularly with an approach like competitive uh, bidding, it largely comes from the economist. It's come to be known as the Vickery mm -hmm. kind of standard. I think those two approaches uh, make a lot of, uh, lot of sense for Medicare in the future. On an unrelated topic, or somewhat unrelated, uh, as you know, the Physician Payment Sunshine Act uh, is now scheduled to go into effect in early uh, uh, next year, um, this being a section of the Affordable Care Act is now coming to fruition. How do you view this development and how do you think about 
this phenomenon in general and its apparent resolution? Clearly, there is going to be an effort to shine some light, some sunshine, as you appropriately characterize it, on all the charges in the healthcare system. And what I believe is important is that this information gets out, and it gets out with a real effort to kind of put it in context. For example, it's clear that in the medical profession, as in many other professions, the vast majority are acting in a professional kind of fashion with great integrity. But there is not, doctor, a profession on earth where you don't have a problem with four or five percent. That involves the accounting profession, that involves the legal profession, by the way, it involves the United States Congress. <laughs> There's not a profession on earth where you don't have a problem with four or five percent. Mm. So the question is, how can you ensure with approaches like physician, you know, sunshine, making information available about costs and patterns, how you can particularly one, empower patients to have this kind of, of, of information, and two, make sure that as you zero in on the four or five percent who are invariably a problem as in any other field, yes. that you don't uh, just impose yet more expensive and punitive burdens on the 95 percent. Another area that you can imagine our viewers are concerned about is medical liability reform. And I know many of them would be very interested in finding out what your vision is or what your prescription might be for a long-term resolution of an issue that has, to this date, not been systematically addressed. In the Healthy Americans Act, what we sought to do was create incentives for the states to in effect say when a doctor practices in concert with their field's practice guidelines, mm -hmm. this would create a presumption of reasonableness okay. should someone then come to challenge their conduct mm -hmm. in the legal system. Mm -hmm. you know, I've always felt that you have to strike a balance between ensuring access to the courts for the consumer and being fair to both the physician and, frankly, to society, because we know that because of the uncertainty surrounding the liability system, uh, you're going to have a fair amount of defensive medicine. Mm -hmm. Finally, and more on a personal note, perhaps, um, I couldn't help but note that you have displayed over a long period of time um, significant sensitivity and interest in the welfare of our seniors. I noted that as a younger man, you uh, founded... Had a, had a full head of hair and <laughs> rugged good looks. And in addition to that, you founded legal clinics that uh, advised the elderly, as well as established the Oregon chapter of the Grey Panthers, an advocacy group for the elderly. Maybe you can say something about what led you onto this path of public service. I always felt that health care was the most important issue. And I, I went to school on a basketball scholarship. I was dreaming of playing in the NBA. It was a ridiculous notion because I was too small, and I, I made up for it by being slow. <laughs> and so when I finally started cracking a book, you know, in in college, I started at Cal uh, Santa Barbara on a basketball scholarship, then transferred uh, to Stanford. I got interested in community service, mm -hmm. and I came to see that health care was the most immediate and personal concern because if you and your loved ones don't have your health, then pretty much everything else goes by the board. So towards the end of my time, uh, in law school, after graduating from Stanford, I went to Oregon for law school. I volunteered for a campaign uh, by Wayne Morris, who was trying to regain his Senate seat. He was one of two who voted against the Vietnam uh, War, really a, a forward-thinking uh, leader. 
and senior citizens would approach Senator Morris and ask about their Social Security or their Medicare, and Senator Morris would say, well, Ron here is going to look it up for you. <laughs> and I would just kind of walk away slack-jawed because of, what do I know about any of this? And I really got interested in it because back then, if a town had a lunch program for the elderly, that was considered a huge deal. There was not this enormous array of services that you see in many uh, communities uh, today. And it became more and more clear for seniors and others, if they didn't have their health, everything else was, uh, was going to be an uphill, uh, uphill climb. And that, I think, is sort of about as short a summary of how, uh, how I made my, my way to, uh, to the healthcare field as anything else. Well, thank you for that. And it's obvious that your continued attention to Medicare is, in a way, part of that trajectory. Thank you. On this note, sincere thanks to Senator Wyden and to you, our viewers, for joining Medscape One on One. Until next time, I am Ellie Adashi.